Hello, talking with Ethan Zuckerman, the director of the Center for Civic Media at MIT, and I'm particularly interested in what uh, you and the center are doing in regard to civics, which used to be kind of a boring subject in school, but I think is essential these days. How, what is your definition of, of civics, contemporary definition, and, well, and how, how is it changing? Sure. Well, Howard, let, let me um, share your fear. I, I think the word civics is, is almost a disastrous one. I think that for a lot of us, we hear the term and we sort of shut our heads off almost immediately. And I think part of that is that civics education in the U.S. was really this sort of education about systems. Here are the three branches of government and here's what Congress does. And it was also very much a historical education and not a very practical education. So it was basically an education designed so that we would understand and appreciate the remarkable system that we're governed by and show up to vote every two to four years. And what I'm hoping we can do is turn that version of civics, which I would think of as a very thin civics, into a much thicker civics where we're engaged as citizens uh, all throughout our lives. And for all of those of us who are making media, sharing media, producing media, a lot of that media isn't just about what we had for lunch. A lot of that media is about what we care about, what we're advocating for, what we're trying to support. And that's a form of civics as well. So what I'm really interested in is what's the shift in civics beyond how do you participate in a representative democracy, which for the most part is pretty thin civics, into how do you become uh, a very engaged actor in the everyday process of having a dialogue about what's important, what solutions we should individually and jointly be coming up with, what we should be advocating for, which is a much richer and thicker civics. Well, of course, with, with the, the web and, and what are now called social media, we're, we're seeing a lot of citizen action that we didn't used to see. Uh, sometimes very, very quickly, sometimes worldwide, um, sometimes effective, sometimes not effective. De describe your, your version of the networked public sphere that, that we see emerging. All right. So if we go back in time, there's a wonderful historical debate in the U.S. Uh, between John Dewey and Walter Lippmann about how the press serves as a public sphere. And Lippmann is basically worried that the press is there to provide the basic information to the public that makes these very emotional decisions about what they should support or not. And he's really sort of worried about the ability to manipulate and the tyranny of the majority. John Dewey looks at this and says, we're all part of this debate. We're all part of this dialogue. We're all part of this public sphere. Everything we do, everything we say is part of it. Now, you might think of Lippmann as sort of the cynical realist in this. You might think of Dewey as the hopeful optimist in this. But the Internet really starts swinging things in Dewey's favor, which is to say that it's much easier for all of us to put forward a point of view, to argue with another point of view, once we end up in a participatory content culture. And so when we talk about the network public sphere, we're sort of talking about a public sphere that's no longer about print journalism, broadcast media exclusively, where there are some very powerful gatekeepers preventing voices from getting in there. There's now a much broader uh, ability to participate. Now, this doesn't free us from what Lippmann was worried about. There's certainly lots of folks all throughout the political spectrum, including sort of social media advocates who are playing with very simple narratives, are playing with manipulating motion, even within the social media sphere. But it is a victory for the Dewey side of things in that we have a much easier chance to participate and we can also be more participatory in terms of what we promote, what we link to, what we share, what we talk about in a way that just wasn't possible in a broadcast era. You know, I use the, the uh, Lippmann-Dewey debate in my uh, classes and often ask my students to divide in half and argue each side and then, and then flip and argue the other side. <clears throat> and, you, you know, to very crudely paraphrase, one of the things that Lippmann was worried about is that the ignorant are easily misled and, and the American public are are ignorant and and Dewey's reply was well we need need better education we need better journalism 
what lessons do you think we can and should and are teaching young people about civics now that they, they can have a voice and they can organize and coordinate? I, I'm not sure that we're necessarily teaching civics all that well. And in many cases, I think the people who are teaching us civics or teaching us this new civics uh, are activists who are trying to figure out how to use these tools uh, in different and effective ways. So I find myself looking at something like Invisible Children, Coney 2012, this incredibly viral campaign uh, that reached a very, very large audience, but also ended up alienating a lot of people, creating an enormous amount of controversy, getting a lot of critique for not being representative. And I think as we start sort of unpacking examples like that, we can bring sort of Lippmann and Dewey back into the frame. We can sort of say, well, on the one hand, it's great that this NGO has done all this work in movement building, or working on an issue that isn't in the mainstream of contemporary politics, are working really, really hard to sort of call attention to something that they're very passionate about. And that to me strikes me as very Deweyan. The flip side is that they did it by creating this incredibly slick, oversimplified video designed to go straight to your heartstrings and essentially said, we're going to make you less ignorant and then sort of proceeded to make you ignorant in a whole different way about that situation, which is very much consistent with, with Lippmann's view on this. So I, in many ways, I'm actually trying to get back to a, a much earlier thinker in all of this. The guy that I'm reading at the moment uh, is Isocrates, uh, who was one of the great rhetors of Athens. And he was um, basically in a competition with Plato. Uh, Plato had one rival school of philosophy. He had the other school of philosophy. And what Plato basically said was, the goal is to get beyond all the illusions. It's to get to the deep truth. It's the whole narrative of the cave and seeing beyond the shadows on the wall and seeing the absolute reality. And Plato has this very elitist view of this. He basically says the very few philosophers who can find their way to the truth, they should be the ones to rule us. So Isocrates comes to this from an entirely different point of view. And he basically says, my goal is to train you for civic life. And civic life in Athens at this point means being able to give a speech, being able to argue, being able to persuade, being able to engage in this sort of thrust and parry of civic life. It isn't just pretty words, it isn't just winning a legal case, but it's trying to figure out how to be that sort of thick, involved, engaged citizen. And what Isocrates really does is basically says, there's a lot of techniques for this, and I can start teaching you those individual techniques, and to be a full citizen, you need to understand those techniques. I think that model works brilliantly for a digital age, where we sort of say that it's not enough to be an informed citizen, it's not enough to vote. You need to figure out how to make these arguments in a digital public sphere. You need to figure out how to advocate. That might mean figuring out how to put out viral videos. It might be figuring out how to, how to influence people on Twitter or on Facebook. And it's very easy to look at that as sophistry, which is, of course, what you know, Plato was, was accusing Isocrates of, just trying to figure out how to use the pretty words and just how to persuade. But there's a sense in which that really deep engagement is the real challenge to us as citizens, not just to engage in the persuasive words, but to engage in the real debate in the real participatory public sphere. So that's what I'm interested in sort of trying to figure out how would we learn, first of all, from practitioners, and then how would we teach people to do that? It sounds like these are probably themes that you take up in your forthcoming book. Is, is that part of it? Well, so weirdly enough, no. Uh, so my, my, my forthcoming book is sort of what I've been working on on the last couple of years, and it's all about this question of whether the Internet uh, makes us better global citizens. And it basically goes after this idea that Many of us, you and I included, really hoped that the Internet would lead to a wave of international connection. And it's proved that it's just much harder than that. We don't naturally pay attention to people in China just because we share a network. And so that book, which is called Rewire, Rethinking Cosmopolitanism in the Age of Connection, um, is all about questions of how we would rewire the net to get international connection.
this set of ideas around sort of Greek rhetoric and the new civics is sort of what I'm hoping to work on for the next few years and figure out ways in which smart people who are using the internet to advocate are using the internet for change uh, are helping redefine how we think about civic life. And I'm trying to look at it, you know, not just from a celebratory point of view, but a critical point of view, because I'm very concerned about critiques like slacktivism. I'm very concerned about movements that end up being uh, manipulative in their populism. But at the same time, I, I think uh, we absolutely have to take this space seriously because it seems like there's a shift in where politics is taking place, not just from the governmental sphere, but into media and public spheres and into activist spheres at the same time. So just um, not to get into great detail about it, but if you could think of one or two or, or three things that educators and parents and others might be able to tell young people about the, the rhetorics that will would empower them and improve the, the network public sphere. You know, what are they? So I think the first thing um, that's become pretty clear from the scholarly research on teaching civics is that classroom teaching of civics is a dreadful idea. Um, you can teach them history, um, but this actual question of how you get engaged as a civic actor, people do much better from service learning, where people are going out and doing projects in their own community, and they may do even better simply becoming activists around issues they care about and learning who to influence and how to influence. So I think taking it out of the classroom and into the practical is very important. Second, I would say that one of the things that we have to learn as we move into the space of new civics is understanding um, sort of what the levers of change are and what the tactics are for moving those levers. So one set of levers of change has to do with getting someone in government to advance your cause, pass a law, so on and so forth. And, and there's wonderful things about using that lever of change. It's very powerful. It works very broadly. But there's other levers of change. You can influence figures of authority, uh, like corporations, like institutions, like schools and universities. You can uh, try to shape the culture. Uh, so that you're changing how a large number of people think about things and how they sort of make decisions at scale. There's a great movement towards people trying to figure out how to come together and solve their own problems within communities. So if you figure out what lever you're trying to move, then there's all sorts of techniques that come into play. And whether that's the viral video, whether it's the social media campaign, whether it's physical protest like Occupy, trying to figure out that sort of distinction between what is it that you're trying to move and how are you trying to do it is probably the first step in helping people sort of think their way through these systems. Wonderful. Very useful. You know, I would love to go on talking about this, but I think people pay more attention to shorter videos. So um, thank you, Ethan. Look forward to but speaking to you again. As well, Howard, you've already figured out a technique that, uh, that works in this space. So I, uh, I appreciate your skills in the digital rhetoric, and it's always such a pleasure to talk with you. Bye, Ethan. Good to see you.